All right, uh, thank you and welcome to the uh, second session of, uh, of, of the day. I have uh, with me my colleague, uh, Frederick Debia. Uh, Frederick, he's, uh, he's going to talk about today the open source IoT and S computing, uh, the Eclipse way. Uh, Frederick, uh, at a personal level, is managing the IoT and edge computing programs at the Eclipse Foundation. Uh, his job was really to help the community uh, innovate and bring uh, devices and softwares together. Uh, Frederick has been always a, a strong supporter for the open source uh, community in the past. Uh, he worked as a product manager, solution architect, and developer for companies uh, as diverse as uh, Pivotal, uh, Cisco, Oracle. Frederick holds an MBA in uh, electronic commerce, uh, a bachelor degree in, 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 uh, in computer science, and as well a uh, uh, bachelor uh, degree in, in education. So, and all from uh, Quebec uh, based uh, university, University Laval. Uh, other than that, uh, he, he's an amazing colleague to work with. And I'm also uh, pr pr proud to mention that we are on the, on the same team. Uh, Partners in crime. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, Frederick, uh, floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Hassan, uh, for the great intro and uh, welcome everyone to my session. So, you know, it's a hard hack to follow uh, speaking like that after Mike, uh, but um, at the same time, it's great because essentially what Mike told you about the importance of open source, uh, the whole point of my presentation is to actually show you how we do it at the Eclipse Foundation in the various working groups we have in the IoT and Edge domain. And, and first, to um, get back to Mike's keynote, I mean, uh, the one conclusion I had, because I had the pleasure to, uh, you know, to, to, to work a bit, to fine tune uh, Mike's presentation with him. And, and the impression I had when I first saw the deck was that literally software is eating the word. And, and, and that's a good thing. You know, digital transformation means that we are moving from fixed function devices to literally software powered devices that are much more flexible and open a whole world of possibilities. And that's a tremendous change for many, many industries. I mean, uh, think about it. The smartphone is such a flexible tool because you can update it and add new apps to it. But even cars today are literally data centers on wheels and will receive uh, new features through software updates. So it's a fantastic uh, fantastic opportunity and a fantastic change for the world. So software is eating the world. But... You know, as Mike said, I mean, open source is integral to digital transformation. And the reason for that is that when you are open, you create real ecosystems. And a good example for that is bread. I mean, bread is, uh, you know, a staple of many, many cultures. Uh, you go in all parts of the world, there are different breads to try out and taste and all of that. And, you know, that's what, makes bread great that there, there is so much variety and also that you can make it at home i mean the secret of bread making is an open secret and it's been for for uh, you know literally centuries and and even longer than that and um this means in turn that bread as an ecosystem is much more valuable uh, we don't know exactly when it has been invented in an historical perspective or when it has been discovered. But the fact that bread, the fact that you uh, just have to take some flour and yeast, a pinch of salt, maybe a bit of sugar, uh, and that you can make bread, the, this open secret means that it, it was able to spread toward the world. And this gave birth to this incredible ecosystem of all sorts of breads throughout the world. Uh, if you apply that to software, it's a bit the same thing. Can you imagine a world where, you know, bread making would be uh, controlled by five big corporations fighting for dominance and where no one except for those five corporations would be uh, making bread? I mean, the whole bread ecosystem would be less valuable if that was the case. And it's the same with industrial automation. Uh, it's the same with IoT. It's the same with software in general. When you are open, you create robust ecosystems that drive innovation and that drive, uh, you know, new new solutions and and 
in turn, this is what makes what we do at the Eclipse Foundation in IoT and Edge so much valuable to the rest of the world. And, and Mike covered this in his, uh, in his, uh, in his talk, but uh, I really want to reemphasize here how important open source is and not for the reasons that you would suspect. I mean, yes, open source uh, doesn't cost a thing, so cost is a driving factor, but the number one reason people are picking open source, and this has been showed in our 2021 IoT and Edge commercial adoption survey, and we'll release the results to that uh, in early June, but essentially, um, Customization has been identified as the number one reason why people are picking open source and why open source is important to them in IoT and edge computing. And this is tremendously important because essentially when you do IoT solutions, when you work in edge computing, you want to customize the solution uh, specifically to the use case that you are addressing. And if you are using proprietary components, you can do it as easily and so, Customization was the number one reason why people open source. And then cost was number two. And number three was more control. You have more control when you have access to the source code. And this in turn means that as an organization developing solutions like that, or as an organization deploying IoT and edge solutions, um, you have the capacity to really address your specific needs because you have the power to customize things and you have more control overall on the solution. And IoT and edge computing solutions, they are pretty much different than your run of the mill uh, IT project. I mean, when you think about IT nowadays, you know, it's DevOps, uh, rapid iterations and all of that. And you can change things right and left, even in the middle of the day, sometimes you will, you will have <laughs> literally when I was building this presentation, I had to reload the page sometimes because there were new features in, in uh, Google suite uh, and, you know, I, I was getting a message that I should reload the page in order to benefit from them. Um, in IoT and Edge, it's a bit different. I mean, IoT and Edge is about a longer lifespan for the solution. When you have a smart building or a connected road or anything like that, even a smart home, you are thinking, you know, about uh, in terms of years, if not decades, for the lifespan of the solution. And then, obviously, uh, the solution that you will have will be heterogeneous. No one player in the market, especially in IoT, can provide you all the key components that you require. And this in turn means uh, that you will have to deal with various suppliers and various uh, uh, even uh, software stacks and protocols in order to achieve your goal. Uh, then IoT and Edge are pretty much about the constraints. You are literally deploying sensors and actuators in the physical world. In the case of Edge computing, you are bringing um, compute and storage as close to the source of the data as possible, which means that you will deploy little edge nodes on wind turbines or on uh, oil drilling platforms in the middle of the ocean or uh, in other environments where essentially the, the compute and storage physical components will be exposed to wide changes, uh, wild changes in temperature, humidity, and things like that. And there's dust and vibration and all of that. So uh, IoT and edge computing are all about the constraints that you need to address in order to deliver a solution. And then there's the connectivity aspect. IoT and edge, you have a network. I mean, that's the whole point, IoT, Internet of Things. So the internet there means that you're connected somewhat to the, uh, to the to, to the public internet. But the thing is your network as you are deploying things in the field won't be stable. It will be unreliable. Uh, the bandwidth will, will change in a pinch and, and you have to design the whole solution around that. Okay. And once again, that's quite different from the typical cloud uh, environment uh, that you will get. Now, Open source is helping out with each and every of those characteristics, okay? The longer lifespan, when you have the source code, it's easy to maintain everything yourself or pay a third party to do so, okay? Uh, without the source code, sometimes you will, you will be stuck with devices that uh, are abandoned that, that you cannot maintain anymore. And, and literally, you know, we, we've seen consolidation in the smart home market, for example, and people have been left uh, with broken smart homes because the specific hub 
they were relying on was proprietary and uh, was discontinued by the maker. Uh, and, and, and that's not necessarily just the case with small players in the market, but huge players, uh, you know, have been doing that as well. Then heterogeneity, it's much easier to integrate and adapt to new platforms when essentially everything is open source. Uh, the constraints is the same. You can tweak the code and even the hardware platform if you are dealing with uh, open source hardware to the specific use case you are. So you can you know, cut the fat, so to speak, and uh, go ahead with a solution which is much more tailored to what you're trying to achieve. And, and the same with connectivity, right? Some uh, connectivity options in the market will, will constrain you to use a specific, uh, specific radio suppliers or, or, or use appropriate modulation. When, when you're dealing with open source, you have the, the freedom to choose and technologies like uh, Dash 7, spirited by uh, the Dash 7 Alliance, are uh, incredible in that space because essentially it means you can use an open modulation and you can use open radio designs in order to have something that's really that gives you the freedom to pick the best hardware and the best software for a specific use case. Now, how does how do all of those things articulate at the Eclipse Foundation and what are we doing to address those various segments of the market in IoT and Edge? Well, uh, the way we are doing this at the Eclipse Foundation is through something we call working groups. And uh, what I will be doing in the rest of this uh, presentation is really to introduce you to each of those working groups and, and cover a bit what's in their uh, respective toolkits. And we start with Eclipse IoT. Eclipse IoT is the most mature of the three. Uh, it's been around for 10 years now, and it's powering literally the leading commercial IoT solutions that you will find in the market. And in the toolkit, we'll find, uh, you'll find libraries targeted at uh, connected devices or constrained uh, devices. You will find edge computing technologies, even though, I mean, <laughs> we have a dedicated edge computing working group, but certainly uh, IoT is a leading use case for edge. And then we have a number of IoT cloud platforms. So I won't be covering all of them in this presentation. It will be impossible. But just to show you the momentum that we've got in Eclipse IoT. So when I started in this job in 2019, uh, we had 4 million lines of code, 38 projects, 40 members. And now, as of today, we have 32 uh, million lines of code, 47 projects, 49 members. That's tremendous growth. And in the middle of all of that, we had uh, the pandemic. So you can imagine uh, how this impacted our recruiting efforts. Uh, but overall, our ecosystem System in IoT is stronger than ever, and we have uh, literally in Eclipse IoT the leading open source IoT community. There are other things that exist outside of it in the market, but we have a critical mass of projects and contributors here. So this is our current membership. We have three strategic members in Bosch, Eurotech, and Red Hat that set the strategy and direction for the whole working group. And then a number of members from all parts of the IT and OT ecosystems. So uh, large players like uh, Bosch and Siemens on the industrial side, uh, large IT players like uh, IBM and Huawei and, and, and others. And then the whole uh, bunch of uh, mid-market players like Adilink and Eurotech and small startups like Aloxi and Sedalo. So really there's a place for everyone at the table in Eclipse IoT. And each of our members there is pushing for open standards and open source solutions, which is a great thing. So uh, to illustrate a bit the variety of what we have in the toolkit, when you think about IoT, you think about protocols. And most of those protocols are industry standards, like CoAP is an RFC uh, spirited by the IEFT. Uh, DDS uh, lives at uh, the OMG Foundation. Uh, lightweight M2M, um, you know, uh, is uh, is uh, something uh, from uh, uh, OMS Backworks. OPC UA lives at the OPC Foundation. MQTT is at Oasis, and we collaborate with each and every of those standard bodies, 
and we have an implementation in open source and, and sometimes several of them for each of those uh, I, uh, very important IoT protocols. And here, uh, for example, we have a critical mass of uh, contributors in our uh, MQTT ecosystems where uh, PAHO and Mosquito are mature technologies in nearly every Linux distributions today. Uh, and now with Eclipse Hamlin, we have an enterprise grade uh, uh, offering uh, there as well that complements Mosquito uh, very well since Mosquito is very lightweight and very good for embedded deployments. So whatever you think about uh, IoT technologies and uh, established standards, we've got an implementation for that. But then we have uh, much more than that because we have our own homegrown protocols and innovations there. And all of them are built in the open. So uh, the PPMP uh, protocol in Eclipse Unite uh, and the Zeno protocol in the... In the um, in the edge space where essentially Zeno is a pub sub protocol with built-in support for geographically distributed storage. So it's very innovative and fantastic. So all of that is great. But in the middle, we have the chance to have an open source specification and open source implementation in the Sparkplug protocol and Eclipse Tahu. And I will, you know, we have a, a, a dedicated uh, working group for that. So we'll keep that for a bit later. But if we take a step back, Okay, and look at this generic IoT architecture that I'm showing uh, on the screen. Uh, and we see this three-tier approach where we have constrained devices or connected things, and then edge nodes in the middle or gateways, and then uh, IoT cloud platforms. And what I'm doing here is just to position the logos for the 20-ish most popular uh, projects that we've got in the space. And you see how extensive our toolkit here. And, and all of that is open source and all of that is literally leveraged by several of our members in their commercial solutions. So when we say that we make uh, open source IoT happen at the Eclipse Foundation, you can, you can visually see this. And that's just 20 uh, or, or so projects. So we have plenty more to offer in our toolkit. So please feel free if you find this intimidating to reach out to me or to our other co community members on our Slack workspace, on our mailing list or, or straight to me on, on Twitter or LinkedIn to, uh, and I can certainly help you out uh, to navigate uh, this extensive ecosystem. Which brings us to the Sparplug working group and Sparplug specification. You know, uh, one of the great things about MQTT is that it's been uh, around for a while. It's very mature. It's widespread. You have plenty of open source and uh, commercial implementations to choose from. But and, and MQTT is, is great because essentially the MQTT specification doesn't say anything about the payload for the messages. But one of the bad things about MQTT is that it doesn't say anything about the payloads for the messages, which means that out of the box, you may have MQTT clients, MQTT brokers, uh, MQTT uh, uh, enabled robots and other software, but they won't be able to speak with each other without uh, a, a serious integration effort. And this is time consuming, error prone. So essentially what Sparkplug as a protocol is trying to achieve is really to make MQTT-based industrial IoT solutions interoperable out of the box. And it achieves that by essentially providing three things. First, uh, a standard set of generic payloads, then a standard set of topic structures. So if you're less familiar with MQTT, um, it's a pub sub protocol and you publish information to something called the topic and you subscribe on the other, to, on the other end on that topic to get the messages. Uh, and topics can be uh, literally anything and everything. Uh, they can be uh, named the robot telemetry or uh, you know anything that the developer likes. And this makes it out of the box uh, very difficult to integrate. So essentially what Sparplug defines is a standard set of topic structures that can be extended and the same for pay loads to support specific use cases. And then uh, Sparkplug provides end-to-end -end session management, uh, stateful session management on the top of that. So really, when you have MQTT-based solutions that leverage on the top the Sparkplug protocol, uh, then you achieve interoperability uh, much more easily. 
And really, when you look at this, the membership for Sparkplug, uh, it's interesting because we have several of our Eclipse IoT members in there, like SiriusLink, Canary, Inductive Automation. And then we have a number of uh, industrial players like Chevron that came in there to, to really bring an industry-based perspective to this. So the whole point is to come together and uh, shape the evolution of, of Sparkplug, not just as a gang of IT or OT organizations, but really with actual end users in the mix. And uh, we've seen tremendous growth in Sparkplug and we'll see more and more growth because what we are about uh, to do is really, well, we are uh, literally building Sparkplug and its open source implementation, Tahoo, in the open. Okay, and that's uh, a change compared to other industrial uh, specifications in the space, in the sense that most of the development of other specifications was happening behind closed doors. In our case, we are doing everything in the open in on GitHub, and you can go there and uh, contribute new ideas to the spec if you like, even if you're not an Eclipse member. Obviously, only our members will uh, get to decide what actually gets in the spec, but the whole process is transparent, open, and vendor neutral, like everything else that we do at the Eclipse Foundation. And the same goes for Tahoo, which is the open source uh, implementation for the Spa plug specification. And soon we'll be launching what we call the Spa plug compatible program, uh, where essentially, uh, Implementers of the Sparplug specifications will be able to use this nifty logo you see on the slide uh, to really showcase that they uh, they downloaded the technology compatibility kit for Sparplug and that their Sparplug implementation passed it. Okay, uh, so you will see this as a sticker on devices and on on the websites of software uh, software publishers uh, that have implementations for it, and really. Uh, this will in turn be featured as a marketplace on the Sparplug website where essentially you'll be able to go there and see all the Sparplug uh, compatible devices and software stacks that are offered by our members. So the program will be open uh, just for our uh, members. And so uh, stay tuned for more details, but we are building a whole open ecosystem around the open source Sparplug uh, specification and, and our members. And then there's edge computing. So edge computing uh, was covered in Mike's uh, keynote as well. It's literally when you bring compute and storage closer to the source of the data. And we have two fantastic open source edge platforms that are uh, shepherded by this working group. So the whole point of Eclipse Edge Native is really to focus on those two implementations. So that's why we say that we are code first and push in the market our approach to edge computing, which is called edge ops, okay? And I will elaborate a bit on that, but really our plan there is to simplify and streamline the mass deployments of edge compute nodes because uh, you deploy 10 of them, it's easy, but the real problems surface when you have hundreds or thousands of them and really our focus is there. So edge ops is literally taking DevOps and making it, um, uh, closer to the requirements of the edge because the edge environment is very different from the cloud and from the data center environments. And uh, we feel there's a need for a specific approach to that. And, you know, I could speak, I could have a full session on edge ops. So if you are curious about edge ops uh, and this brand new approach to edge computing that came from the, 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 the collaboration of our members, uh, please download the white paper. Um, you know, it's offered on our website. Uh, there's the link uh, uh, in there in the slides and I will publish it in the chat once I'm done uh, with, this, uh, with this session. All right, uh, so who is working on this vision? Well, essentially industry leaders. So you have Edilink and Edgeworks, the two organizations uh, between, uh, behind our uh, two edge compute platforms. And then a number of players that come together as adopters or simply influencers uh, in the 
in the edge uh, computing space uh, and, and really uh, what they, they, they are doing is to uh, collaborate to evolve those two edge ops implementations. So what are they? Uh, on one side, you have Eclipse IO Fog, which uh, there will be a session on uh, later today. Uh, and it's a centralized take on edge computing for container orchestration. And then you have FogOS, it's written 05, what is pronounced FogOS. And FogOS is a completely decentralized take on uh, edge computing, where essentially there's a unified compute fabric that puts together uh, microcontrollers, edge nodes, and uh, cloud resources. And uh, FogOS is relying on the Zeno PubSub protocol. Uh, which is really innovative and had, uh, has great features as, uh, you know, uh, a protocol supporting edge deployments. And uh, there's a session later today on uh, Zeno as well, where you can learn more about it. Okay, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we are about to publish the results of our 2021 IoT and Edge Commercial Edition survey. So this will be available on June 8th. So please uh, keep your eyes open uh, for that. We do annually two of those surveys. So the commercial adoption survey early in the year, and then there's the developer uh, survey that will be conducting this fall. So once again, stay tuned uh, and please participate uh, to those. And that's all I had uh, for now. So thank you very much for uh, listening to me. And now if there are any questions, I will have a look and uh, see if I can answer them. So there's a question here from Alexander who's asking, are there any plans for open source products for microcontrollers, Cortex architecture like MQTT bridge or similar? And uh, the answer there is, um, well, probably what we have in our toolkit is a bit too heavy to work on, on, a, on a microcontroller in the sense that uh, typically you wouldn't run necessarily a full, full fledged broker there. However, with a lightweight Linux distribution and let's say Eclipse Mosquito, you can already have a fairly small package to deploy on a very low power gateway and, and thing like that. And I think that uh, probably something around the Cortex M4 or, or similar could be enough if you have enough memory to run Linux and Mosquito on the top of it. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we are collaborating, for example, with the Linux Foundation uh, to ensure that our uh, building blocks uh, work well on uh, the Zephyr uh, real-time operating system, for example. Uh, and uh, many of them work on FreeRTOS and others as well. But uh, what we are doing there is more of a client approach where essentially uh, there's built-in support for MQTT in, in Zephyr. So this works well with Mosquito and Amlon and our uh, other suite of uh, MQTT technologies. And then um, uh, what, what's happening is uh, we are uh, we are having uh, other parts of our ecosystem that are building uh, compatibility for Zephyr and FreeRTOS. So, for example, Zeno has a client version, uh, which is called Zeno Pico. And Zeno Pico now has support for Zephyr once again. But that's more in a client mode rather than in broker mode. And then another question from Shant. Uh, will Eclipse work closely with RISC-V architecture in Edge and Fog Realms? Oh, yes. Uh, we are uh, collaborating closely both with the RISC-V Foundation and something called the Open Hardware Group there. And essentially, uh, what we are doing is to ensure that our, uh, our building blocks, once again, compile well on the RISC-V based environments. Uh, the Eclipse Foundation has a sister organization that's called the Open Hardware Group uh, that we are uh, collaborating closing, uh, closely with. And what the Open Hardware Group is doing is to take the RISC-V instruction set and produce uh, in open source uh, core designs for uh, RISC-V based microcontrollers and other CPUs. Okay, And they are doing that in the open on GitHub. So you can go there and download the system Verilog for the chip 
chips and go to a foundry and get those processors made, or you can modify them and validate them on FPGAs and things like that. So I'm involved uh, heavily in those conversations to ensure that we have a great support for RISC-V in general and uh, the core five line of uh, CPUs that are built at Open Hardware Group in the open uh, and ensure that uh, our Eclipse IoT building blocks work well with that. So uh, you can, we are collaborating, but you can expect, um, uh, you know, deeper or uh, that collaboration to deepen over time as uh, the, the core five line of CPUs matures at Open Hardware. Uh, so it seems we don't have uh, any more questions for now. So thank you very much for attending this presentation. And thank you very much for attending our event. It's two days of fantastic presentations. And there are many things that I just, you know, <laughs> I just alluded to in this talk that you will learn more about throughout the day. So please stay tuned for the whole day. Uh, thank you again. And uh, I certainly look forward to interact with you on Twitter as a, I'm Blueberry Coder or LinkedIn or on in any of our community meetings. So thanks again and have a fantastic rest of the conference.